Welcome to the next video in the Mathematical Logic series, this time talking about consistency and maximal consistency. Okay, the definition of a consistent set is fairly straightforward. A set is called consistent if there is at least one formula it cannot prove. And of course, if x is not consistent, we call it inconsistent. And it's worth noting that although the definition is stated about any formula, we could just as well have taken it to be the bot formula as well, right? So even fixing that one as the formula that it cannot prove, that would be enough. So let's give a quick rundown of why that is equivalent to the given definition. So let's first show that if it is inconsistent, then it cannot prove bot or uh, falsum. And this is really immediate, right? Because if it is inconsistent, it can prove everything, therefore it can prove false. Okay, now in the other direction, let's assume that X can prove falsum and then use that to prove that X can prove every formula. Well, if X can prove falsum and falsum, as we've said before, is syntactic sugar for this canonical contradiction, then we can use rule, you know, conjunction rule two to split that up. We can then use negation rule one to derive any formula. Okay, in this video, I'm just gonna mention a couple facts without proof. The proofs are very easy. So the first proof is that if X proves alpha, or sorry, X proves a sentence, sorry, a formula alpha, if and only if X together with its negation proves falsum and x proves negation alpha if and only if x together with alpha proves falsum. Okay, next we define the concept of maximally consistent. Intuitively, this just means that it is consistent and could not be bigger, right? So if you add any sentence in, it becomes inconsistent. But, uh, you know, uh, equivalently, we define it in the way that I have written on the slide that the set X is maximally consistent if it is consistent, but any superset of it is not, right? That's only slightly different from what I said before, because rather than just entering in one extra formula, we're entering any superset anyway. Okay, now we're going to discuss what's called Lindenbaum's theorem, which says that every consistent set can be extended to a maximally consistent set. Now, the book states it more uh, rigorously or verbosely, whichever you like, but a little bit more technically what we're saying is that for any consistent set X, there always exists some superset which is maximally consistent. Now, this one I'm going to get a little chatty describing how this proof goes because this is not like a lot of the other proofs that we've seen so far. Uh, it's one that I don't think that, you know, a lot, a lot of people could kind of come up with on their own. In particular, it's going to use Zorn's lemma. So uh, if you've never seen that, or if it's been a while, then that, you know, the whole thing can be tricky. So anyway, let me just kind of uh, give a long-winded sort of chatty description of, of how you could kind of warm up to this proof. So intuitively, if you want to take a consistent set and extend it to some maximally consistent set, the most obvious naive first thing to do is to just grab some formula such that neither it nor its negation is in the set and enter it into the set. That could bring its own concerns, like how do you know that it, uh, a, you know, an arbitrarily chosen formula not already in the set is, if you entered it, it wouldn't be, right? There, there are ways that that could uh, turn into an inconsistency, but let's not even worry about that because there's a whole other worry which is, okay, so if you, if you manage to find a way to decide whether the sentence or its negation should get entered into the set, then suppose that you write that that may not be the only sentence or formula that you need to add in, so then you do it again and you do it again. Well, even if you were wisely choosing which formulae get added in, uh, you'd need to make sure that you eventually got to everything. So, right, so even if you took the result of this procedure, union everything that you take along the way, that may still not be maximally consistent because there's no guarantee that this particular sequence of formulae that you've 
chosen necessarily explored every, you know, every formula in the space of all formulas. So this is a proof that is not guaranteed to work. There is a way to amend it if we assume countability of our propositional variables, but that is, it, it, right, if we did it that way, then our proof would only be valid for that particular setting. And we will really want, especially when we get around to talking about ultra filters and other things like that, we don't want to be so constrained. So let's not do it that way. So what you could realize is, okay, well, if any one procedure of adding formulae into our set is not guaranteed to work out, then maybe somehow we want to think about the space of all possible consistent supersets. And, you, you know, you, at least on some level, you kind of think that, well, then the one that we want has to be somewhere in here. And maybe we can find some some way of picking one of the things in this massive uh, universe of sets, uh, which is the one, or at least one of the ones that we want. So one way to try to, you know, decide which thing in this massive universe do we want is to try to generalize the idea that we were just talking about, about adding a formula and then adding another one and adding another. That really feels like a chain, right? It feels like you've got a bigger thing and then a an even bigger thing that contains all the earlier things so that in some sense this kind of mentally uh, makes sense as something like a chain. It's almost like you're chaining the elements together. Uh, now the thing is, you may wish that your chain was not necessarily quite so linear, but maybe uh, you could grab this formula and that formula, right? Like, you know, maybe you don't want to be, you don't want a chain that is quite so constrained, I guess. So there's this generalization of this notion of a chain, which we often use in uh, set theory. And this is what Zorn's lemma talks about, but let's just say what it is. We define a chain of subsets. K is a chain, and that means that K is a subset of H, which is to say, right? remember, H is the set of all consistent sets, right? Uh, or consistent supersets anyway, for the set that we started with, X. So K is a subset of H, meaning that it too is a set of sets. And to be a chain, we require that if you take any two elements out of K, these will be sets of formulae, right? So Y and Z elements in K means that Y is a set of formulae, Z is a set of formulae, and to be a chain, we require that one must be a subset of the other. So that in some sense, right, they can always be kind of ordered, that there is some kind of like smaller to greater relationship among all these things. That's what we take a chain to be. You know, intuitively that kind of, you know, because there is this sort of like ordering that, that any two things, one of them is the greater one gives you sort of a mental image that like the sequence is growing and that sounds like a nice desirable feature. So hopefully that makes some amount of sense. Chain, right, any arbitrarily chosen chain may not be a very impressive chain. After all, if uh, your chain K just contained a single set of formulae, that's guaranteed to be a chain, but it almost like, right, m most of those are not going to give you as much as you want. So anyway, so, so any one chain is probably not that interesting, but if you take the space of all of the chains, then uh, effectively what we want to do is have a way of picking uh, one of them that is maximal. And effectively that's what Zorn's lemma tells us must exist under a certain condition, which we'll see right now. So let's finally say what Zorn's lemma is. Zorn's lemma talks about a set of sets like we have here, H. And it says that if every chain in H has an upper bound, and when we talk about an upper bound here, what that means is something in H which contains the chain as a subset. We'll see a little bit more of that later. 
But that's what it is to be an upper bound is that like it's a set in H which contains the chain as a subset or everything in the chain as a subset. If every chain is upper bounded in that sense, then H has a maximal element. That is to say, there is some element in H which contains every other element as a subset. And that thing, that's exactly what we want. That maximal element will prove in a minute, but, but that maximal element, it's pretty easy to believe, will turn out to be the maximally, maximal consistent set that we're looking for. So here in the slide, I'm again sort of just demonstrating what it is for the set U to be an upper bound for the chain K. So U to be an upper bound for K is to be an element of H. And if we take anything in the chain, it's a subset of U. So that's what it means for U to be an upper bound. For any given chain, right? So again, we're, we're thinking about H being the set of sets, K being any arbitrary chain taken from it. We will then take the union over all the sets in K, and that's what we will call U, and that is what we will argue is the upper bound for the chain. Now, part of this is completely trivial. The part where we say, if Y is something in the chain, then Y is a subset of U, follows trivially from definitions. It's barely a sentence proof. The thing that deserves a little bit more work is proving that U is itself an element of H. Okay, so how to show that U is an element of H? Well, recall H is the set of all consistent supersets. So really the only challenge here is to prove that U is consistent, which is the same thing as showing that it does not prove falsum. For contradiction, let's assume that U does prove falsum. I'm, right, the proof gives a slightly more detailed proof, and if you want to see any, you know, if you want to see a more detailed proof of this, maybe leave a comment, and if I can find time, I might do a more detailed proof of this. But in any case, as a quick summary of what's going on there, since U, for contradiction, we assume proves falsum, then it proves falsum by some finite subset of U. Now that finite subset of U, you can take any element. I mean, after all, U just is the union over the chain. So you take one of the elements from this finite subset, it's in some element of the chain. You take the next element in U, or the finite subset of U, it's another element in the chain. So on and so on and so on. Now, this chain, right, uh, uh, you know, as you go along, one of the sets that these elements came from must be a largest set, right? Because after all, it forms a chain. So if you get all of these elements and their corresponding set in the chain that they came from, one of those sets must be the largest one because they're all comparable to each other. So then you just take that largest one, right? So, so let's let Y be the largest of those sets that these elements came from, and that Y must contain all of those finite elements. So Y also proves falsum, but that just means that, fa sorry, that means that Y is inconsistent and therefore is not in H, but by our assumption from earlier is in H. So there's the contradiction. And now we have that U is consistent and all the rest of the proof is basically done because we've you know, set it up to be basically done at that point.